Well, hello. It's good to see everybody this morning here in second service. Uh, if we've not met before, my name's Drew. It's good to have you with us today. Uh, today, you're actually, if you're new, you're, we're coming in at the end of a conversation that we've been having for the last month. Today, we're putting a bow on a series that we have called Renew Your Mind that's actually found, its foundation is in uh, what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, when he says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but instead be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Now, that's a verse that probably a lot of us know, but if we're honest, easier said than done, right? Easier said than done. And so our goal through the series has won, first and foremost, uh, to give you insight into what God's Word says about how we actually experience and how we uh, experience a renewed mind by the power of the Spirit. And, and some of it is to just give you tools, uh, practical exercises that you can go do as you walk in obedience and actually experience uh, the renewal that we are talking about. And so by way of recap, quickly, uh, in week one we said if you want to change your life, you have to change your thinking because our thoughts have so much power. And we were, we were challenged to identify the, the strongholds in our life, these boomerang behaviors, these things that seem to just keep showing back up in our experience that we've really struggled to experience victory from, to identify those things and, and so that hopefully we can begin to experience freedom and victory over those things. Uh, because, but the problem is a lot of times for, for most of us, the reason we've continued to struggle with them is because we've just dealt with what's on the surface. We just deal with what we see when the real problem is actually below the surface and what we're thinking in the thoughts behind that, which led us to week two that in which we just said, man, you've got to know that you have a very real enemy named Satan that wants nothing more than to destroy you by destroying your mind. And his number one tool in the, in the battle for your mind are lies because it's just a lie that's planted in the garden of your mind can grow into a mature tree and begin to bear fruit of death and destruction and so uh, we, we said if, if you want to change your life you have to know what is true and so the the challenge for this week two was to do the hard work i mean it was hard the hard work of identifying the lies that you're actually believing and then to identify them and replace them with what we know to be true in god's word in, in week three pastor Luis was here and and he he challenged us he said if you want to change your life you have to take responsibility for what you allow in your mind because similarly to our physical health whatever you put in uh, affects your your physical health whatever you allow in your mind will affect your mental health whatever you allow in will bear fruit in your life and so the, the question is, you know, what, what are the voices that you're listening to? Who are you allowing to influence you and your family? What are the, who are, what are you allowing into your mind? And so uh, the, the homework for week three was to those truths that you identified in week two, to just meditate on those things, maybe even memorize them just to begin to embed them in your heart and mind. And then last week, Scott Tilley, he just, he challenged us to live with an eternal perspective. He, he challenged us to live by this faith filter with the faith filter that no matter what we experience, no matter the hardships that come, the pain, the disappointment that we experience in our lives, we know that, that we can live with this eternal perspective that even when life is not good, we know that God is still good. And so we live our life not by sight, we live our life by Faith And so Scott challenged us last week to just sit down and spend some time meditating and praying and, and writing down some of the hard things in life, the, the hard seasons that you've experienced, and now look back at them and see how God's faithfulness and how his goodness showed up in those moments. Because it's there. And, and by doing that, what that allows us to do is it gives us confidence that today as we walk through hardship, today as we walk through pain, even when we can't see God's goodness in our life, we know it's there. It just may take some time to actually see it for what it is. Now, we could continue this series all the way to Christmas and we would not run out of things to talk about. Unfortunately, we don't have time for that, okay? We got other things to do. 
And so uh, the goal of the series has not been just to spoon feed you and say, hey, here's what you need to do. Get out of here and go do it. You know, it's been, it's been to give you some tools that you can put in your tool belt to be able to walk in obedience from this point. And, and some of these exercises and things we've talked about, you may need to do on a recurring basis. You may need to make this an annual exercise. Some of the verses that you've identified may need to become your life verses that you memorize and they just become a part of your being. They just become a part of who you are so that you can move forward in victory and freedom by the power of the Spirit. And so today, we're going to put a bow on the series. We're going to conclude it by talking about uh, something that should feel pretty practical to us because it's something that I'm sure every person in this room has experienced, and yet it happens exclusively in the space between your ears and in your emotions. And today we're going to talk about the difference between conviction, which is a tool of the Holy Spirit, and condemnation, which is a tool of Satan. Because here's, here's the truth, okay? The expectation, and we said this at the beginning of the series, the expectation is not that you're going to walk out of this place and have a perfectly renewed mind and you're never going to struggle with anything ever again. Like those, those boomerang behaviors, those strongholds in your life, it's not like those things are just going to melt away and you're never going to have to deal with them ever again. W- what's important is when they arise again in your life, how do you handle those things? When, when, you, when you experience a failure around those things, when you begin to struggle, how do you navigate those moments? Do, do you allow yourself to fall back into that rut? Or are you able to bounce out and begin to quickly walk in freedom once again. It's the difference between conviction and condemnation. And and the challenge with these two things, with conviction and condemnation, is that they feel similar. Like at the beginning, they feel very similar. They're kind of like doppelgangers. You know what a doppelganger is? Where they're they're two people that look really similar. They may even have similar mannerisms. You know, they're kind of like identical twins, but they're not related. A doppelganger. There is a, uh, there was a, in college, there was a guy, his name was Mike, that um, we had similar features, we looked kind of the same, and so our identities every once in a while would get messed up and mixed up, which was kind of flattering, because he had a lot bigger muscles than I did, and, um, but there, there were these mo- moments where um, it actually, uh, <laughs> Bree, who's my wife, and then his fiance, now wife at the time, actually had some troubles at times um, from, a, from a distance in the right situation. Let me just give you an example. So there's one time that I'm standing on campus, and all of a sudden, uh, these two hands, like, hook up from underneath my arms and just, like, firmly grasp, you know, right here, my pectoral muscles. Uh, the problem was I wasn't Mike. And so it quickly kind of became this awkward, you know, oh, hey, you know, embarrassing, slightly embarrassing uh, situation. It was awesome. And, um, <laughs> and then, uh, and then and then Bree actually, she ran into a bit of a problem one time. So Bree and I, even to this day, we'll still like, um, we'll psst at each other. So to get each other's attention from a distance, like if you're in Meyer or something like that and you hear a loud psst, please don't psst back, Okay. I'm trying to find my wife. If you start psting all over the place, like it's gonna, it's gonna mess me up, okay? So keep your psst to yourself. Um, so, but at Bethel, so we're Bethel grads over in Mishawaka, and so if you've been to Bethel, there's like these ponds in the middle and that kind of stuff with, you can see a way. And so to get each other's attention, we would psst at each other, but you'd have to psst kind of loud. And so there's one day where Bree sees who she thinks is me, and she just starts psting her little heart out. You know, she's like, psst. Sorry. Uh, the, and she's like getting frustrated by this. Like, why are you not psting back at me? You know, and the problem was it wasn't me. You know, it's a case of mistaken identity. And thankfully, we never got ourselves in too much trouble, uh, Mike and I, by, you know, being real muscular together. And, um, but, the, but here's the deal. If you cannot discern the difference between conviction and condemnation, you're going to have problems. Like we were able to avoid those problems between Mike and I. If you can't discern the difference between conviction and condemnation, you're going to experience some real, some real problems in 
your life. And, and again, they're, they're initially hard to discern the difference because at the beginning they feel, they feel really identical because conviction and condemnation, they both begin with the emotion of sorrow. Conviction and condemnation, they both feel like sorrow at the beginning, which isn't a bad thing. Like, don't hear me say, like, sorrow. I know some of us are like, I don't want to feel sad anything. So, it feels like sorrow, and that's not a bad thing because when we sin, when we fall short of God's standard for our lives, like, we probably should feel some level of sorrow and regret about that. It's in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, Paul writes this, he says, and do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. And so Paul's saying that when when we fall short, when we sin, Paul says we actually grieve the Spirit of God. We, we, we bring sorrow, we disappoint the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit that's living inside of us. And the way that that sorrow in the Holy Spirit manifests itself in us is we feel sorrow. Like if we have the Holy Spirit in us and we can grieve the Holy Spirit and yet not feel any grief ourselves, that's a problem. If, if, we, if, we can, if we can act foolish, if we cannot live the uh, abundant, if we're not living the abundant life that God desires for us, if, if we are falling short of the mark and we have the Spirit of God in us and we don't feel any sorrow or grief about that, I would say check your heart. I don't know if the Holy Spirit's in there. Like if you can go out on a Friday night and get plastered, if you can run around with all the juicy gossip tidbits just running your mouth, telling everything, ever, if you can blow your lid in anger, it, if you can fall short, if you can grieve the Holy Spirit and yet you don't have even like a little voice in your head before or after, even if it's just a little whisper going, ah, don't do that. And I probably shouldn't do that. You know, that thing that you think, don't do that. Or afterwards going, yeah, that was wrong. Probably shouldn't do that again. Probably should repent of that. You know, that if you don't have that little voice, it's a problem. If you can grieve the Holy Spirit without feeling grief yourself, I don't know if he's in there. See, and it's not a problem that we feel that because Jesus is actually pretty clear in John. 16, 8, that alongside like illuminating scripture, our hearts and minds to, to God's truth in scripture, conviction is a, a, a role of the Holy Spirit in our life. John 16, verse 8, it says this, it says, and when he, talking about the Holy Spirit, comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. See, it's kind of like the nerve ending. So conviction is kind of like the nerve endings in your fingers, in your hands, if you touch a hot stove, your hand like is like, woo, you know, you pull back right away. It's like, hey, there's a little bit of pain. I'm going to pull back so that I don't continue to feel that pain. And, and that's kind of what conviction is in our life. It's a little bit of pain. It's a little bit of sorrow. It's a little bit of grief that goes, hey, don't keep doing that. It's going to get worse. Don't keep going down that path because all you're going to do is if you continue to go down that path, if you keep your hand on the stove, it's going to get worse. You're going to inflict more pain in your life. So conviction is just the Holy Spirit like a little siren going, woo, 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 stop. Repent and turn and go back the other way. This is the kind of sorrow that God wants us to experience. A a sorrow that leads to repentance. A sorrow that leads to confession. Not a sorrow that leads to a much darker place known as condemnation. And so in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and Paul is having to address some issues with the church in Corinth, and he's written what he refers to as a severe letter. He's correcting them. He's having to call them out on a few 
things. And so he says this, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8. Paul says, he says, I'm not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you, though I was sorry at first, for I know that it was painful to you for a little while. Now, I'm glad I sent it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have, so you were not harmed by us in any way. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience, it leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow which lacks repentance results in spiritual death. So Paul's saying the sorrow that God wants you to experience when, is, is when you fall short, when you sin, when you fall short of God's standard, it's to recognize that emotion is going, stop, don't do it, to recognize that for what it is, repent, which literally means just to turn and go the other way, to confess your sin and to be made right with God. To not keep doing it, to not do it again. See, conviction says I did something wrong. Conviction is a recognition that I did something wrong. Condemnation says I am something wrong. I did something wrong or I am something wrong. And condemnation is is a tool of Satan. And it is based on lies. We've talked about this in the series. It's based on lies that Satan is just trying to plant in the garden of your minds. And if you haven't figured this out yet, you need to hear me say this, okay? Satan is a big old jerk. Like you should not, like, he, because he will, he will spin the narrative on you so fast, it's not even funny. Because he's more than happy at the beginning to, to try and convince you to, to entice you, to rationalize, to minimize sin in your life. He, he will try and do everything he can to convince you to fall short of God's standard. He'll, man, this is not that bad. That thing, that's not that bad. You know, everybody's doing it. You know, you're going to do it. You're going to feel so much better after you, you know what, you can't even resist it. It's just a part of who you are. Like, just, just go with it. Side note, the Holy Spirit will never rationalize sin in your life. Like the Holy Spirit is never going to say, yeah, I know that's what God's word said. I I know that's what God's standard is, but just, it's fine. He'll understand. Never. Holy Spirit will never do that. And yet Satan, he will entice you to sin. And then the moment you do, the moment you go to that porn site, the the moment, uh, the the morning after that you go and you, you sleep with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, the moment you blow your lid, the moment you start running your mouth with the gossip, the moment you pop the pills, the moment you take the bottle to your lips, the moment you sin, the moment you fall short, he will flip the narrative and be like, I cannot believe you did that. Are you kidding me? Do you know you're the only one that struggles with that? Do you know, can you believe that you did that? You know you're never going to be able to bounce back from this. You know God's never going to be able to love you because of that. You call yourself a Christian, and that's how you live? He will flip the narrative on you so fast, and that is called condemnation. It becomes a tool of Satan. And instead of repentance, instead of condemnation leading to repentance, instead of uh, that emotion causing us to remove our hand, we just keep it there. And it gets worse. And this is what we see in the garden, Genesis chapter 3, right? You know the story, fall of Adam and Eve. They sin, Adam and Eve sin for the first time, and and then that evening, God is walking through the garden, and what do they do? They hide from God. Right, so instead of going to God, instead of just confessing their sin, instead of repenting of their sin and being put back into right relationship with God, they they hide, they run, they conceal their sin. They're, They're hiding in shame. And yet, Paul's pretty clear in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. He says, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Like if you're a follower of Jesus, condemnation is not a part of your story. 
And so conviction says, I did something wrong. Condemnation says, I am something wrong. Conviction leads to repentance. Condemnation leads to shame. Conviction leads us to confess, while condemnation leads us to conceal our sin. Conviction leads ultimately to our behavior changing, while condemnation, our behavior continues, just oftentimes hiding. And ultimately, conviction results in joy. So sorrow that results in joy because our relationship with God is restored, where in condemnation, it just continues to result in sorrow. We just stay stuck. Okay, here's the grand finale, okay, of this series. If you don't get this, you're not gonna get it. Like, if you don't, if you can't, what we're about to talk about, okay, so if you've tuned out, now's your time to tune back in. Your identity is defined not in what you do, but in what Christ has done for you. Okay? Like you gotta, you gotta grasp that idea that your identity, who you are at your core being, is not defined by what you do. It is defined by what Christ has done for you because condemnation will, will attach all of your sin and all of your shortcomings to your identity, to who you are. Condemnation will say, you are your sin. You're just a sinner. That is who you are. And some of us may be like, yeah, well, that's what the Bible says, right? We're just sinners. We're just, we're just sinners saved by grace, Right? And the answer is, yeah, we, we, we sin, but those of us who are in Christ are no longer sinners. That is, that is not who we are. Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. This is what Paul writes. He says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Now stop right there. Paul doesn't say you're not guilty. Paul doesn't say that you're, you're not guilty of, of your sins. That's not what he says. He says, you're not without, you're without fault in God's eyes. So it's like if you walked into court and maybe you committed a crime and you walked into court and then you get there and the judge and the jury are like, yeah, you're without fault. I know you did it, but you're without fault. Don't worry about it. Just move on, right? You're without fault in the eyes of the judge. And some of you are like, the, like the rule followers in the room are like, well, that's unjust, that's not how that should work. You know, th that doesn't feel very fair. Paul continues. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He's so rich in kindness and grace. Here it is that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. And so, so while God declares us unjust, while God declares that we are faultless in his eyes, he's not being unjust because the penalty for all of your sins has been prepaid. Like it, it's already been taken care of. Like, Jesus already did time in the grave for that. Jesus already took the death penalty that you deserve for that. God's wrath that should have been poured out on you has already been poured out on Jesus Christ on the cross. It's not unjust, it's just already been paid for. It's already been done. And so listen, you've got to understand, instead of being a sinner, we are a child of God who happens to sin. Like you've got to create that separation. You've got to, you've got to have that designation because that designation, that, change, that makes every difference in this life. 
in the life to come because you were born. We were born as sinners. We were born as objects of wrath. We were born as enemies of God. And that, Paul would say in 1 Corinthians, and that is what you were. But not anymore. That is what you were. But not anymore. The moment you gave your life to Christ, your identity at its core changed. And you went from being a sinner to a child of God, adopted into the family of God. You just don't always get it right. You just, you sin sometimes. You went from being a slave to sin to being free in Christ. And if you don't understand the difference in identity, if you don't understand that designation, you're really going to struggle to ever really be able to, to discern the difference between conviction and condemnation. It's going to be really hard for you to be able to tell when you're experiencing the sorrow of conviction that leads to repentance and when you're experiencing sorrow that only leads to condemnation. See, your identity is not in what you do, but in what Christ has done for you. If you are in Christ, I said if, we're going to talk about that. If you are in Christ, you are free. Like, you all, every stronghold in your life, every boomerang behavior in your life, you already have freedom over that thing. You already have victory over that thing. Not because of what you have done, but because of what Christ has already done. And that is who you are. And so if, you are, if you're a follower of Jesus and you, you feel imprisoned to a stronghold in your life, if you are a follower of Jesus, you feel imprisoned by, by one of these boomerang behaviors in your life, you are living in a prison without bars. The problem is that your spiritual eyes have just been closed so you can't see that all you got to do is stand up and walk out in victory. And it's in this process of renewing your mind, it's in the process of the Holy Spirit renewing your mind that your eyes are open and you just go, oh my goodness, I just got to walk. It's already been done. I just have to walk in victory and freedom. And remember, the beginning of the series, right? Change is possible. The reality you live in today doesn't have to be the reality you live in forever. So, a couple comments and then I'm, I'm going to be done, okay? First one is this, okay? Be quick to confess and repent of your sins. Be quick to confess and repent of your sins. Grace what we're talking about, this unmerited favor, this gift from Jesus, like that does not nullify the need for confession. Grace doesn't nullify the need for confession. Jesus' brother James, he writes in James chapter 5, verse 16, he says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. There's something about confessing your sins, about praying for each other. Like you're already forgiven. But yet there's something healing about confession. And so the way that we walk in this, the way that we walk in freedom, the way that we walk in victory, it's actually kind of paradoxical a little bit because I know there's a lot of us who like to think that in order for me to be spiritually mature, I just need to not struggle. And so we just pretend like we don't struggle, when in reality, spiritual maturity is actually humbling yourself to a point to be really honest about how you struggle. It's to humble yourself to the point to be really honest about the strongholds that you do struggle with, when you do fall short in your life. And there's something liberating, there's something cathartic about, uh, about experiencing conviction, about experiencing that emotion of sorrow, that, of, of grief, recognizing it for what it is, repenting of it, confessing it, turning and walking the other way and realizing that thing's not going to follow me. Like I, I have freedom from that thing. And yet so often we think spiritual maturity means I'm just going to struggle in silence against this. That's not, that's not maturity. 
It's to recognize it for what it is, to repent of it, to confess it to somebody and turn and walk the other way in victory and freedom and leave that thing where it's at. See, I believe this, okay? The more honest you are about sin in your life, the less you're going to struggle with it. I believe this. The more honest you are about your shortcomings, the more honest you are, the more willing you are to talk about it, to confess it, the less you're going to struggle with it. Because I, I, I believe that the more that you're honest about it, the more you confess those things, the more aware of, of you are of the cross, the more gratitude you have for the grace of God in your life. You begin to realize, man, this isn't about me anyway. I'm just going to see that. I'm going to confess it. I'm going to turn and walk away from it. I'm going to walk in freedom by the power of the Spirit living in me. And so listen, if you don't have anybody that you can confess to, if you don't have anybody that you, you can repent of your sins and look dead in the eyes and go, hey, I'm struggling about this. If you don't have that person in your life, you gotta. You've, you have to have somebody that you can bear your soul to. And so let me just make a little plug here, okay? If you don't have that person and you don't know how to find them, go to the Connection Center. Before you leave, sign up for a community group, and you, it, it's going to take some time. It's going to take some effort. It's going to take some trust being built, but you will find yourself in a relationship with a man or a woman, whatever's appropriate for you, to be able to look at them and bear your soul and confess your sins so that you can find healing. And then here, number two, okay? If you haven't given your life to Christ, you need to. If you have not given your life to Christ, you need to, okay? Because I'm going to wound you a little bit here, okay? Because I love you. If you've not given your life to Christ, you are, a, you are not a child of God who sins. You are a sinner if you've not given your life to Christ. And, and I know that doesn't feel good. But listen, if you don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, you will never experience, to re experience a renewed mind. If, if you don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, you are never, the only kind of sorrow that is possible for you is not a sorrow that leads to repentance. It's a sorrow that's of this world that Paul's pretty clear. He says, listen, that's just going to turn into spiritual death. And so I'm just loving you enough right now to say, listen, if you've not given your life to Christ, everything that we're talking about today does not apply to you. When we say that your identity has changed, you don't have the opportunity for conviction. You only have the opportunity for condemnation. And I don't want that for you. Like, I, I hope you don't want that for you. Like, I want you to walk in victory. I want you to walk in freedom. I want you to have hope and to experience a renewed mind. I want you to have experience the abundant life that Jesus is offering. But you've got to say yes to Jesus. You've got to give your life to Jesus to receive the Holy Spirit for any of that to begin to be possible. And so if that's you, you can do that right now, okay? Just pray. Father, we just, we thank you for, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've given us the Holy Spirit to, to convict us of what is true, to convict us uh, of righteousness. Father, you've given us your Holy Spirit not only to convict us of when we've fallen short, I, I believe you've given us the Holy Spirit to convict us of of our standing before you, of our identity, that for those of us who are in Christ, there is no condemnation. That, that we have been adopted, we are co-heirs with Christ, and that our identity is not found in what we do, our identity is found in what Jesus Christ has done for us. And so, Holy Spirit, would you convict our hearts and minds? Would you lead us into victory? Would you lead us into freedom that's already been purchased? Father, I thank you that you didn't leave us and make us figure this out on our own because that wouldn't have been possible, but instead you intervened in a very real and tangible way through your son, Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life we couldn't live, who died the death we could never die, who was resurrected in power and now sits at your right hand. We thank you that you intervened on our behalf 
that even while we were still sinners, you sent Jesus, you loved us. And so Father, I just pray that right now for anyone in this room, anyone who's watching online who's never yet given their life to Jesus, that even right now, Holy Spirit, would you just begin to knock on the door of their heart? Would you begin to draw them near to you? Would you convict them of, of their sin, of their shortcomings, that they've missed the mark? Would you help them see, would you open their spiritual eyes to see what is good and what is true and that it's not that you are against them, that it's instead that you are for them, that you love them so much that you sent your son Jesus, that if even in this moment they would just declare with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that God has raised them from the dead, that they would experience life everlasting today. And if that's you, Father, would they just say yes to the still small voice? To your drawing, to your prompting, even now. And even if they don't know exactly what it means for the future, God, they would know that in this moment their identity has been changed and they've been adopted by the God of the universe, the God that knit them together in their mother's womb that from the foundations of the earth has ordained good things for them. Holy Spirit, just draw them. May they say yes to you in this moment. God, we thank you so much for your love for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.